Hey guys, it's Otto here, and welcome to my in-depth guide to balance druid PvE DPS and Season of Discovery. In this video, I'll be going over the runes and where to find them, your talent builds that'll help you out in raid, your stat priors on gear, as well as your pre-bis and bis gear that you'll be looking out for. I'll also be going over your rotation, any consumables and buffs you might need, as well as the macros and recors that'll help you out. If there's any other questions you have or suggestions you might have for a future video, you can leave them down below in the YouTube comments or catch me live at twitch.tv forward slash auto underscore wow. I am currently the rank 1 Boomkin on logs and I hope to maintain that spot as long as possible and I hope that you guys will follow me along on this journey. I hope you guys enjoy the guide and I'll see you guys in a bit. So we'll be starting the guide off with the rune system, arguably the most impactful change made by Blizzard for Season of Discovery. What this allows us to do is socket three brand new abilities or passives into our gear in the chest, legs and glove slot. These new abilities greatly improve our performance in raids so you'll want to pick them up as soon as possible. So in the chest slot we have the Fury of Storm Rage Rune. This reduces the mana cost of our wrath by 100% so this gives us a 12% chance per wrath cast to make the next healing touch we cast within 15 seconds instant. Now at a glance this may not seem like a powerful DPS rune considering it affects healing touch However, it takes us from being one of the most mana dependent classes in vanilla to being one of the most mana efficient classes in Season of Discovery. In the glove spot, we'll be using Sunfire, which is a nature spell damage equivalent to Moonfire. It's a very powerful dot in both single target and AoE multi dotting situations. In our leg slot, we'll be using the Star Surge rune. This rune started out being the most underwhelming rune in our toolkit. However, it has recently been buffed to a 6 second cooldown and the base damage has been raised massively, transforming it from our weakest ability now into our strongest and highest priority ability in our rotation. You definitely want to pick this up ASAP, it's great while leveling and it's great in the raid. Up next we have the talent builds for raiding and for leveling. I'll only be providing like one talent build for raiding and one for leveling because we're only level 25. There's not a lot of variation that we can have with our points. We're really locked in on what we can play in raids. For leveling, it can be slightly different, or you can just use the raiding spec. It's a bit slower, but you will get a feel for the spec as you go. It also does a lot more damage, but you'll have a lot less mobility in the open world. So starting off with the raiding spec, we have 5 out of 5 improved wrath, and this synergizes really well with the Fury of Storm Rage Rune that we talked about previously. Um, you want to get those free Barath casts, you want to get them much faster, especially if you have mobs hitting you. You definitely want to have a faster cast time. Next you'll have 5 out of 5 improved Moonfire. This gives you 10% damage on your Moonfire and crit chance of your Moonfire. But this also affects Sunfire, so you'll see that your Moonfire and your Sunfire will be critting a lot more. And the dot will take slightly more as well. Next we'll go for 3 out of 3 Thorns. And while this may not affect you personally on your DPS meters, you will notice that this can do like 20 to 30% of a tank's damage on AoE pulls or any boss with adds. It's definitely useful and there's nothing really else that'll improve our damage, so I think this is a good pickup. Next you want to go 2 out of 2 in the Nature's Reach. This definitely helps improve our range of play in a boss fight. We can stand further back. You know, you can just uh, really position yourself well for certain boss fights. The range is super nice. Also in PvP, it can be really nice to be star surging from like a mile away. Super good. And then finally, we have one point in Vengeance. And while you wish you could get more points, right now we're really capped on our crit chance. So it doesn't really affect our damage too much yet. But I feel like next phase, when this goes up to 5 out of 5, we get huge crits. We'll have more crit chance. And I definitely think Boomkin will scale better in that regard. So definitely want to pick up the one point in Vengeance. Other than that though, we can do an alternative leveling spec if you want. You can play balance with the spec. It's probably recommended you play Feral though because it does go into the Feral tree for the Feline Swiftness. You want to go 5 out of 5 in Ferocity. You won't be really using any of these, these abilities but you can if you want to. Next you can go either 2 out of 2 Brutal Impact or 5 out of 5 Feral Instinct. You can decide. I prefer to go Brutal Impact just in case there's any PvP. Then I'll go 3 out of th 3 out of 5 in Feral Instinct, and then 2 out of 2 in Feline Swiftness. Next, you're going to want to pick up the last 4 points in Improved Wrath, because you're going to be using Fury of Storm Rage while leveling. Again, it's not the ideal to be balanced with the spec, but you can play it. You definitely want the speed for open world movement, it'll increase your leveling speed by a ton. 
Otherwise, you can just play cat with this and then get to level 25 and swap over to the balance build. But yeah, those are the only two real balanced druid specs that I'd recommend. If you want to do more PvP, and I probably will release a PvP guide separate to this because this is mainly a PvE guide. You can remove improved wrath if you don't want to be hard casting rats all the time. You can go one point in feral charge, one point in nature's grasp. And the last two points you can kind of mess around with. You can go improved wrath if you want. Or Fura for a, maybe a bit more chance to get a feral charge off when you go into bear form. You can decide. So yeah, those are the specs for balance tree. So the most common question asked about balance tree in Season of Discovery is what are the stat priorities? Because mana is not really a problem for us at all, intellect and spirit really go down far on the list of what's important. What's really important though is stacking spell power. And since half of our rotation, Sunfire and Wrath, scales with nature damage, and the other half of our rotation, Moonfire and Star Search, scales with Arcane, people are often confused as to which one is better to stack, considering they're looking at buying greens with plus spell damage, you want to know if you want to be buying nature or arcane spell damage greens. The real answer to this question is both of them are about equal to each other. And when you really get into the nitty gritty of it, if you're not moving as much and you're casting more wrath casts and you're able to do a perfect rotation, then nature does eke out slightly ahead of arcane. However, if you are moving, if you're canceling your wrath cast here and there, then arcane actually becomes a better option. When it comes to PvP, if you care more about PvP, Arcane is a better thing because the burst from Star Surge and Moonfire will be better than the hard casting of Wrath and Sunfire. So for if you're more PvP oriented, then maybe go for Arcane. If you're more PvE focused and you want to have a perfect rotation, then Nature is slightly better. But at the end of the day, you just want to find the highest spell damage that you can find in every slot. And so I'll be going over the quick breakdown of what is the most important stats to look out for. So starting off with neutral spell power, since this is both arcane and nature spell power, this is worth two times as much as either of them. So you'll have neutral spell power as your top priority to find on gear, and then you'll have nature or arcane spell power. Then you'll have intellect for a little bit of crit, and just in case you ever do run out of mana, the little bit of extra mana does help. And finally, you'll have Spirit and MP5 at the bottom. Okay, so here we are on 60 Upgrades, a super useful website tool that'll help you track your gear that you have, as well as what gear you want to be getting. You can track each slot, what's an upgrade, what's not an upgrade, and you can make a full set for your previous, a full set for your best in slot, and a full set for what you have at the time. So starting off with what we have here, the pre-best in slot gear, we have a whole bunch of greens that um, you can buy off the auction house and not a lot of dungeon drops or crafted gear. So keep that in mind, this will be quite an expensive thing to buy, but once you have it, you'll definitely notice a massive DPS increase. So starting off with the helmet, we have the engineering gloves, sorry, the engineering helmet, which is the shadow goggles. You can only wear them if you're an engineer. So if you have engineering, it's nice, but it's definitely not mandatory. It has zero spell power, so it's not very valuable for us. And the same thing for the necklace. This is a super, super expensive BOE off the auction house. I would not even bother getting it. I do personally don't even have a neck right now because no spell power on the neck means that it has very little value to us. And the price is just way too much for what it gives. Going on, we have all these arcane and nature's wrath pieces. Keep in mind that these are interchangeable between nature or arcane so don't like get all stuck up on whether i have arcane here or nature these can be either as long as they're the highest spell power that you can find in that slot so the shoulders are a special example because there are a blue pair of boe shoulders called the magician's mantle and these are very good and they're pretty much equivalent to the green single spell damage pieces the only difference is this has a bit more intellect and a little bit less spell power coefficient because it's 5 spell power which would be equivalent to about 10 nature or arcane. This has 11 so I would say they're pretty interchangeable depending on what you want. I'll probably go for the greens because these magician's mantles can be very expensive 
and these can be pretty much optional best in slots so just pick up a pair of green shoulders and you'll be fine going on to the cloak it's the same story the chest piece it's the same story the braces it's the same the staff is the same the no casting gloves are a pretty common drop from wetlands they're probably not so expensive on the auction house and they have neutral spell power which is quite powerful there's the belt which you can only find in arcane and that's the same with the legs so if you're looking at options for belts and legs keep in mind you can only buy arcane spell damage for either of those slots and then you have the boots which can be either as well so going on to rings we have the law keepers ring this is warsong gulch honored and it's very powerful this is your best in slot ring farm that up as soon as you can the lavishly jeweled ring or any other intellect ring is fine so if you can find a green ring with intellect that's fine there's no other spell power ring so just pick up any intellect ring it's probably a low priority as well so don't spend too much on it and then trinket wise there's not many options um the minor recombobulator acts as like a semi mana pot so you can get one of those it's off the mana pot cooldown so if you ever need mana you can just pop this it only has three charges and can only be used by engineers so as you can see with the shadow goggles plus the minor recombobulator engineering is one of my preferred professions along with tailoring which you'll see with my best in slot set so the rune of perfection is also from warsong gulch i'll put a text up whether it's friendly or honored i can't remember right now and it decreases the magical resistances of your target by 10. And this does matter on the last three bosses of the raid that have fairly high resistances. This will increase your DPS by a fair amount on those two bosses. Three bosses, sorry. Moving on to the best in slot set that I have set up. I will be going through each slot as well as giving you maybe an option if there's something else that drops in the raid that you might want to go for. Keep in mind though that each of these pieces is pretty set in stone as best in slot. There's not a lot of option besides maybe the shoulders. Yeah, so going with the helmet, we have the tier set helmet. And we are using the two set, which does pull it above using this Rakama's ten tatted thinking cap. So this is technically by itself a higher DPS increase. But with the two set from the set, we have the helmet and the chest piece. I would go for that instead. And it's leather. And all this leather spell power gear that drops from the raid is pretty much free for you because there's not a lot of competition. If you're on Horde side, you might have some shaman healers or elementals trying to go for that gear. If you're on Alliance side, there's literally only holy paladins and arresto druids that'll compete with you. And you'll probably be the only druid in the raid. So not a lot of competition. You'll be getting a lot of this stuff quickly. Uh, it's only the cloth pieces and some of these weapons and trinkets that'll be a big competition. So helmet i would definitely pick up the leather helmet if you can otherwise the cloth two set is an alternative probably harder to get as well as the thinking cap which by itself is pretty good there's the necklace which is the only spell power neck in the game so i would definitely pick that up it's a big priority there's the shoulders as i mentioned they're best in slot or magician's mantle is an optional choice as well whatever you can pick up they're both good the cape from Priebus is also best in slot. Definitely pick up one of these if you can. The chest piece, um, it's definitely powerful with the two set. By itself, it's equivalent to any green that you can buy as well. So it's just a flat increase. Then you have the glowing leather bands. It's a leather wrist piece, very strong, much better than any other option. You can, If you don't have them, then you can go for a green there's the epic staff this is by far your biggest increase as you can see i have spell power weighted very highly so it's way better than anything else that you can get obviously there's a dagger and offhand combo which comes out to around 19 spell power but um this is obviously higher with 26 so definitely pick this up if you can it's going to be highly contested though then there's the slick fingerless gloves these are nature only and healing power so the competition for these will be very low and they are slightly better than the black fingerless gloves there's the ancient moss cinch leather belt much better than the green and it's free to get pretty much there's the soul leech pants which are very powerful legs but they drop off the final boss and they're cloth and there's no other spell power leggings that are better than a green this one is obviously worse it's only seven the green gives 16 so definitely try to get these cloth pants if you can get them off a caster it's gonna be tough 
And then finally there's the tailoring boots for body pieces. I get a question a lot of whether it's better to go leatherworking or tailoring. I definitely think tailoring is a better option considering these boots have a flat 7 spell power and 1% hit. The hit means pretty much nothing, it has no weight because the hit cap of the raid is 5%. If you have the world buff plus your mana oil, you need 0% hit after that. So hit technically at the moment means very little, I wouldn't worry about the hit. And the leather working gloves also have 1% hit but 0 spell power and they have an on use that gives 10% damage which is very good. But it only lasts 10 seconds and has a 10 minute cooldown. So. An average BFD rate, if you're doing well, is like 30-40 minutes. You'll only get like 3 or 4 uses, and it's not that big of a portion of the boss fight. So I definitely value the 7 spell power at all times more than this 10% damage proc or on use effect. So that's my opinion on the crafted items. Then you have the ring from Kelris, the best ring, it's the only other spell power ring in the game. The Warsong Gulch ring from Priebus, very good. The trinket of the last boss quest item is definitely something you want to pick up if you can. It's very competitive. Everybody wants it. It's the only trinket that actually does anything in the game. So try to get this if you can. It drops every single week. Hopefully you get lucky. I haven't gotten it yet. Hopefully I get it. It's a pretty big upgrade for me. Alternatively, you can use the minor recombobulator. Or the insignia of the alliance can be useful in certain situations in the raid. I do not believe there's many hard CC abilities though. So you can equip it if it's the only trinket you have. And if you ever get CC'd, you can use it. There's also the black Murloc egg, which is mainly just a cosmetic trinket. Someone's a little Murloc that does pretty much nothing except gives you five shadow resist. So yeah, definitely not important, but it's a, you can pick it up if you want. And that's about it. Um, just to quickly go over the weapon again, because I didn't explain the alternative, is there's this dagger of willing sacrifice as well as the offhand, which let's see if I can find it. How do I find it here? Uh, I probably won't be able to find it, but I will show it up on the screen. It is a pretty good alternative if you can't find it. It also has some bonus armor on it in case you want a PVP, so it's not a bad option. So yeah, that's the gearing guide. Moving on to the next section. In this section of the video, I'll be going over the AoE and single target rotations for the Balanced Druid. If you're wondering which rotation to use on which boss, I have a separate video that I made earlier this week that goes over each boss in the raid, explaining which boss to use which rotation on and any other tips you might have. So I'll be leaving that in the top right hand corner and let's go. So the single target and AoE rotation for the Balanced Druid is actually very similar. And the best way to explain the balanced druid rotation is in a 12 second cycle. So this cycle repeats every 12 seconds and as long as you can perform it perfectly each time, you'll do the maximum amount of DPS that you can do. So each fight starts off with a pre-casted wrath into a star surge. Hopefully both will land at exactly zero seconds into the fight. You'll follow that up with a sunfire, a moonfire, a wrath, another star surge, three more wraths and then the cycle will repeat. Keep in mind, if you're required to fairy fire in your raid, you'll replace the first wrath cast in every fight with a fairy fire and then replace the fairy fire if it ever falls off with whenever you have the next wrath cast. So if fairy fire is about to fall off, whenever your wrath is about to come up in your rotation, you just replace it with a fairy fire again to refresh the debuff. Other than that, if there are any adds you need to be dotting, so this is the AoE rotation, you want to replace any Wrath GCDs with a Sunfire on a multi-dot target. So you can only fit in four extra targets to multi-dot, and keep in mind for each add that you multi-dot, you're more likely to run out of mana at the, start of, at the end of the fight. So keep mana pots on hand in case there are lots of AoE mobs you need to be multi-dotting. Otherwise the rotation is very simple. Just follow this 12 second cycle on every single boss and you'll do, you'll do great. And finally, since you'll be getting a bunch of Fury of Storm Rage procs and you're likely to have a large amount of mana in the fight, should the raid leader or healers ever call for help, you can throw out some instant cast heals. And this is a nice piece of utility that's unique to balanced druids. And if you enjoy the hybrid playstyle in a raid, then that's something you can be doing as well. So we'll be moving on to the consumable and buff section of the video. 
Keep in mind that some of these will be more mandatory if you want to perform at a higher level and some of them will be more niche in case you have a bit of extra gold you can get some survivability or utility options as well. When it comes to world buffs there are three that can be obtained in the first phase of Season of Discovery. Keep in mind that these are all very impactful to your DPS so dying in a raid will massively affect your performance. The first of these buffs is the Boon of the Black Fathom which is a 25 spell power 3% hit and 20% movement speed buff. It lasts for 2 hours and it can be obtained in either Thunder Bluff or Darnassus whenever someone hands in the quest item from the final boss in the raid. This can be Chrono Booned and is very important to do so as soon as you get it. Up next we have the 10% damage buff from Darkmoon Fair. This can be obtained while the event is active in either Elwyn Forest or Thunder Bluff. And finally we have the Ashen Veil Rallying Cry. This can be obtained in the PvP event in Ashenvale by looting one of the mini bosses or little adds that you kill during the event. This will give you a mark that you can hand in to one of the main leaders in your main base camp. It will give you a consumable that lasts for 2 hours and cannot be burned that gives you a 5% damage and healing buff. Keep in mind this cannot be burned so you have to use it in the raid and if you want to save it for a second or third raid you can only do it by logging out for the, for the week. This will reset at the beginning of every weekly reset, so Tuesday if you're NA or Wednesday if you're EU, so try to make the most of it while you have it. There aren't many consumables in Phase 1 of Season of Discovery that provide a meaningful impact to our DPS. However, the BFD Mana Oil is a priority to get as it gives 2% hit and 12 MP5. This only works in the raid, however alongside the world buff, it allows you to achieve the hit cap without any gear. Up next we have the Mana Pot or the Lesser Mana Pot. These aren't needed for many fights, however it's nice to have a couple in case of emergencies, especially on bosses where there's a lot of adds that you're multi-dotting, you might risk running out of mana. So if you can afford the large Mana Pots, then get those, otherwise the Lesser Mana Pots will work as well. When it comes to food buff, you want to be using the Smoked Sagefish for the 3 MP5, and if you're missing a mage in your group, you'll want to replace that Arcane Intellect buff with either Elixir of Wisdom, or a scroll of intellect. To finish off the consumable list, I'll flash some options on the screen for any utility or survivability consumes that you might want to pick up. Keep in mind that none of these are mandatory, but they're nice to have if you have the goal to buy them. Okay, for the final section of this video, I'll be going over any macros or weak auras that I use in the raid. I'm personally not a fan of having an overly complicated UI. So I did set up my own weak auras to track my dot timers and my fairy fire, any fury of the storm rage procs that I get, and the star surge cooldown. But I also have a weak aura that tracks the debuffs on nameplates as well. So if you're close to the mobs and you're multi-dotting, you'll be able to see the debuffs on each mob around you. You have to be quite close since the max range on nameplates is quite short on classic. And besides that, I'm also using the Barney raid kit, Black Fathom Deeps. This isn't really necessary if you have the DBM, but I use it just to help with tracking the fights CDs. Um, just a quick demonstration on the weak auras. So if I walk up to the mob, you can see the weak aura that I made just tracks the dots here. As well as fairy fire. And if I get a proc, it would show up on the left. And you can also see the debuff on the nameplates as well. So if I have AOE mobs, let's say like over here, I pull a couple mobs in and hope you don't die. You can see it's tracking the nameplates and the debuffs on each of the mobs. It is quite useful, so you can see which mobs you haven't doubted yet. I recommend picking it up. Again, I'll be linking all of this in the description below. If you want to pick up any of them, you can find it there. And when it comes to macros, um, I also don't use many macros. I only have one for healing touch. This is just a mouse over macro, so I don't have to swap off my target that I'm wrathing or doing my rotation on. I can just hover over someone on the raid press the healing touch keybind and it'll instantly heal them without having to swap off my target. It's super useful if you do want to off heal though, so I should recommend picking this one up. This macro I use for the boots. It's a bit underwhelming considering I thought that the threat reduction from the boots would be permanent. It is only temporary and as far as I can test, it's not actually 30% threat, it's actually just a flat 999 threat that gets removed for the duration that the debuff is active. So you do get that 30% damage dealt debuff for 6 seconds, as well as 30% reduced threat. 
it's actually 999 reduced threat and once you cancel aura the boots it will give you the threat back so this isn't as good but it is a pretty good panic button to press if you pull aggro you can press it you'll lose aggro and then hopefully you can cancel it as soon as the tank has a taunt active or whatever finally there's the dynamite macro if you're an engineer all this does is it throws the dynamite at your cursor without having to double press it because when you would press a dynamite it would like first activate um the, the reticle and then you'd have to click again to throw it all this does is it just throws it immediately at wherever your cursor is so quite useful if you're an engineer okay so if you made it to this part of the video i want to thank you so much for watching i really appreciate the support in the last video i appreciate all the subs the likes the follows all of that stuff um, this video in particular was quite more complex to edit than the other videos that i've made but um, it was a lot of fun i learned a lot and I hope you guys learned a lot as well. Um, I'll see you guys in the next video. Keep tuned. Any suggestions you have for improvements. If you want it to be a bit more edited. If you want it to be a bit less edited. More content. Any questions. Just leave it down below. I'll see you guys in the next video.